Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing yes playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice 9.11. And let's continue this. Oh, we need to speed this up. Yep. Ah, a little more. Okay, basing advance. advance. Oh, that's nice. Um, oh, thank you, Venezuela. Yes, we're watching Europe because that's where the most interesting things are sort of happening right now. Okay, they did move out. A large stack of units there. Unless they came over there. No, well, they moved them from there. Um, maybe these guys are just moving across Europe now. Submarine fire control. Um, okay, yeah, we'll stop that. Sure looks like they're getting ready for an invasion. This is the Soviet Union. Don't know how he got over there. Could be placed there by by an event or something. There are some gifted German units, but no core German deployments down here. Okay, medium navigation radar. Um, Yeah, we can do medicine advance. Okay, twin engine remit research. And yes, let's Shift that to light bomber. And standard infantry branch upgrade. Good. Get that done. Yeah, I think we will. To upgrade engineers. Yeah, these guys are just ultimately doomed without supplies because they'll just, no matter how good they are, they'll eventually lose all organizations. So, attack by any, you know, a headquarters unit thing will uh, defeat a huge stack of whatever it might be eventually without supplies. Okay, structural improvements on. Um, 
various amphibious ships. Yeah, garrisons, tropical island garrisons, garrison detachment, and infantry will get bonuses with that, so that will be good. Now, um, and I'm still talking about this because I uh, need to talk about something while we're playing. I could rant and rave about politics or other things, but we'll try to keep it on topic here. Talking about the future of this series in particular, it's not just, oh, I lose a big battle with the Americans, I'm going to quit. Um, and definitely viewership matters, okay? As I will say, because... Um, uh, jungle unit training, I think that is here. Okay, yeah. 42 is too advanced. Special forces. Um... Um, viewership levels definitely matter. If no one wants to watch, why why make a, a video? Um, but what I'm sort of saying is, is, is if we have the great bulk of the front line of the fleet destroyed and we're facing big overwhelming invasions by the Americans and they, you know, because I've definitely seen it playing as the AI as Germany, including one time before we'll get to that in just a second before i started making any video series remember one game i got late into the game because if you're a long time black ice player you, you often sort of chase the latest versions and it, for me it was even more so than i think most players is because being a modder hey new version out yeah the new version out yeah but they had one out three days ago yeah i know but this one has something great new or bug fixes well does your mod work and this was normally i'd wait a week or two just not to be an ass but just to go after releasing a new black ice version let them release it and then get bug reports in from you know because no matter how many people you have testing it you're going to have um 10 times 100 times more people playing it and doing different things to find stuff that doesn't show up in just a few whether the the few is five or one or two play tests or 50 play tests you just magnified out so wait for the first major bug fix then go in and update my mod but since i would need to update my mod and i normally also i was adding to my mod as i'm playing and working to it so it was you know update to the new version plus five new events 50 new events whatever it was okay put that out there and now that you know get the update made and ready and put it out there well now i want to play on the latest version because i sort of modded and played a lot um you know so i'd have to start over so I, not just starting over to test 1936 and just making sure things sort of work but i mean really sort of playing into the game did that a lot so did a lot of not get very far in um black ice but when i did i remember one game doing really well as germany um you know taking out the soviet union i either had or was either had invaded britain i think um or getting ready to and things are just going well pushing down into africa and you know all this kind of stuff and then i sort of look over and go oh tokyo's fallen um probably about like this much of japan had fallen now japan still owned all of china indo china you know indo china um, indonesia much of these islands you know so it still had many many um good places but america had you know somehow plowed taken out a couple of uh um islands and then landed in here and nothing the japanese had literally nothing the japanese had um, could stand up to the Americans. So I sent over very rapidly a bunch of, because I like, as you know, light infantry type units for Germany. Um, I also like standard infantry too, but light infantry is good for the swamps and um, rough terrain and just sort of, you know, having that. I thought, oh, that'd be great. Send those over to Japan and they'll help fight out because I just was figuring America, and probably I still think this was largely the case, is America lands while um, Japan has most of its land forces 
somewhere else, not, you know, sitting in Japan, you know, down wherever it was. Um, and I think that was a case too. But figuring that was it. So just, you know, put in a couple of cores of, you know, light infantry into all these mountains and whatnot. We'll do well. And I get them there and they're just, just slaughtered by the Americans. Any sort of attack I make just gets them slaughtered and any sort of coordinated attack against them just destroyed. And so I had to move over panzer divisions with heavy armor of one type or another uh, to be able to um, combat the American invasion units. And I did, and I pushed them out of Japan. Um, but it was just, you know, standard infantry for Germany wouldn't have dealt with these um, armored divisions that had come into. I had to really, and they were, I guess, just really highly buffed up because of various things. And so it was just, you know, oh man, um, needed, you know, either a, you know, heavy tank destroyers or heavy tiger battalions in a in a division to make any headway against these American forces. So I'm still picturing that in my mind and thinking, okay, if that kind of thing is hitting me, nothing I can practically build as Japan is going to be able to defend against that. And so if I can't defeat that using air and sea power, you know, sink the ships, um, there's no way for me to win and it would only be the AI doing something utterly stupid, like, oh, yeah, um, we're going to guard San Francisco instead. Um, and the AI might do something that stupid. But, um, you yeah, know, so that's why I'm sort of saying is, if my fleet is sunk, and if I start seeing some of these overwhelming um, invasions, and if viewership is sort of lowish, sort of like it is now. I think it will pick up once where the Pacific War goes on. I think there's a bunch of people sort of, sort of like I know the period, you know, post the fall of France, somewhere in there, before the invasion of Russia for Germany, it sort of goes low. Once the invasion of Russia happens, I see a significant percentage bump in viewership um, for playing as Germany. I'm sort of hoping and or thinking um, that's will be once we get the Pacific War going. But um, if it comes down to this sort of kind of low viewership that we have now, and they're sort of like, you know, you know, just watching me butt my head against a brick wall is probably when I'll quit. But hey, if viewership takes off, they love me watching whatever, great. But if not, that's just sort of give you the expectations. You know, if you want to bail on the series now, fine. Um, you know, watch what you want. Watch what interests you. The Taisei Yoku Sa San Kai, the Imperial Rule Assistance Association, was a parafascist organization created by Pri Prime Minister uh, Fumi Maru uh, Kone on the on October 12, 1940, to promote the goals of his Shin Tyson, the New Order Movement. Hmm. Parafascist. Wonder what that means, parafascist. No, it's not parachute fascists. It's like paramilitary. It's not real military. It's sort of kind of, you know, um, militia type police armed with military weapon type um, forces but para fascists it evolved into a um, status ruling political party which aimed at removing the um, sectionalism in politics and economics in uh, the Empire of Japan to create a totalitarian single-party state which would maximize efficiency of Japan's total war effort during World War II. When the organization was launched officially, Kanoe um, was hailed as a political savior of the nation in chaos. However, internal divisions soon appeared. Yes, as we've seen and I've talked about, there was massive internal divisions. Um, 
some of them very much um, ideological and directional base. And those are two different things. One, you know, um, various ideologies plus, you know, foreign expansionism versus not foreign expansionism, direction of foreign expansionism. You know, there was a bunch of that going on. Plus, I do believe also simply um, jockeying for power. Because, you know, whether, you know, whatever party you, you, you support generally, and let's talk in the American terms, you can, um, you know, see, particularly in some of the um, primaries, and I've known of um, some real, yes, hatreds would be in some, uh, some cases, but um, others would just be sort of eh, competitive dislike kind of thing more than any real hatred between people like uh, within the Republican Party. And, and I'm talking big leaders. I'm not talking about, you know, the voter I'm talking about, you know, eh, whatever, it's a, whether it's the state level or the national level or something. Sometimes they just, you know, hate um, somebody else. Not that they hate, they disagree with their philosophy. It's just whether it's something personal between them. You know, you didn't support me when I really needed it, and so I lost that election. And then now that I've come back, I hate your guts, or because you supported somebody else that you liked better, or whatever. You know, within the party. So it's not like anything necessarily needs to be ideological, you know. And so um, you have a, a like um, a few senators in the recent um, Lee Demise, John McCain, hated Trump. Just hated Trump with a passion. And in my opinion, did some really boneheaded moves just because he hated Trump and blocked certain things. Just because Trump was pushing it. Not that he disagreed with it. And I'm very disappointed in Senator Ben Sass, who is still very much a... Um, never Trumper and I've liked a lot of what he promotes but he really does sort of um, seem to be just because Trump's for something he's against it in, in, in cases and not just hey I agree with him when I agree with him and I disagree with him when I disagree with him that's what he sort of says publicly but I can just because I've because I have been on the inside at the congressional level worked as a staffer involved for the campaign staff, which is different than the actual congressional staff, but there often people move around between paychecks and whatever and do that. So I've been on the inside. I've known, you know, I've sat in the car with um, congressmen or um, other elected officials together and I was driving and they were talking. So I've overheard these things, nothing. And at the level I'm doing nothing like secret information. It's just, you know, a uh, couple of people, you know, a couple of people running for different offices that aren't competitive, competing against each other, um, but in the same area, you know, the idea one may be running for um, Congress and the other one's running for state senator or whatever, you know, so they're sort of, you know, they're not p political competitors and they may or may not like each other. These I'm, ones I'm remembering back today did sort of like each other and I was driving them around and they were, uh, you know, to a different event and talking a little bit in the back. So I've heard some of these conversations. And this is why um, people, oh, it's no big deal that Dianne Feinstein's um, California driver, who was a Chinese-American, is found to be an active um, Chinese spy. Oh, well, he never got any secret information. He was never had access to the top secret information. That very real, well may true, be true. And Dianne Fein may have never mentioned a secret fact on the phone in the car. Um, I can't imagine her not mentioning a secret fact on the phone sometime in the car driving around California, especially San Francisco, where you don't want to drive yourself because not to drive, at least back in the day when I was up there somewhat routinely and a few times a year, um, not that the driving was so terrible, the parking was so terrible. So, um, you know, you don't maybe mind driving yourself around, but once it comes time to park, you just want to get that car away from you. So having a driver would be something that you would do a lot of in San Francisco more so than in L.A., but even in L.A. Um, and so her on the phone 
to somebody. I can't imagine over the years that he was sitting in that car that he ne that she never mentioned something that was um, covered as classified information. I just can't imagine that she didn't mention it. Uh, well, did that guy have a security clearance? You mentioned. Well, I'm not saying that you know she was running down the list of the spies in um, um, China in front of this guy and this guy was you know taking notes or memorizing it or or had a little recorder on him and then turned it over to the um, Chinese um, spy bureau but you know she could just mention casually offhand sort of refer to things that you sort of pick up on and you know he goes goes back look into case blue well, what's case blue about I don't know but she referenced something about case blue and it and it seemed important okay you know kind of thing like that and, you know, I, I mentioned this in the idea that you, you do know that during uh, sometime during the Obama administration, I forget the year, um, basically every single um, intelligent asset, human intelligent asset the U.S. had in China was um, killed or disappeared, you know, into the system picked up. One of them being shot on the literally on the steps of the one of the consulates. I don't think it was the embassy in Peking, but I think it was somewhere else, you know, as entering or leaving um, the U.S. facility was shot in broad daylight. Every single one of them. Poof. That's what we've been told. Now, maybe there's others that, um, you know, a different network or something that we don't want to tell them. Oh, well, they only got half, so keep looking for more. But it was a bunch of people died that were Chinese working for the U.S. So, yep, China can look at them as traitors. Um, and, yep, yeah, that's after a fashion. Um, you know, they are. But, um... They all got killed. Is that because of Dianne Feinstein, senator, head of the the, the Democratic lead uh, and the Times head of the Senate Intelligence um, Committee? You know, the people that get all the intelligence briefings? Hmm. Yeah. And that was, has been a supposedly, at least what the public sort of knows, a big mystery of how China got that information. What leak, What? how did they get all of them? And they got, they rounded them up in a very short period of time, in a time period that, um, you know, some of them just disappear, you know, so they're just, you know, picked up and taken away and interrogated and no one's ever heard from them since. So they might still theoretically be alive, but um, probably not in good shape, but it's been years and probably they've just been executed by now, but a bunch were, are, were known to be dead. And again, the one very public one. Um, yeah, um... So maybe they know exactly how it leaked, but just don't want to tell us because that's secret information. But could it have been her driver that got a hold of some, well, maybe not paper paperwork, but a hold of some, you know, documents on, you know, from a computer into a thumbnail drive or something? I don't know. I'm not blaming her for that, but we know that happened during the time that he was the spy and she was in charge of the intelligence thing now he was just again only accessing stuff that made it to california and i think hanging out at her house a driver would hang out at her house waiting for her to be ready to go somewhere you know when she's in california so what kind of access did he have you know where did he wait for her did he wait in the kitchen was that next to the home office could he slip in and turn on our computer i don't know i have i have literally no idea um and it could be an entirely different source but i am absolutely sure because i have been in that place again just for you know three or four months i was not the driver but i was working on the political staff and sometimes driving the candidate around and sometimes riding with them along with some other people driving around, you know, to an event, you know, two or three staffers going with the candidate to an event. So I got to hear a lot of these things. But because I've done that, I am absolutely sure that he picked up all of the sort of juicy details is who might be in favor of this, who might be against that, you know, voting in the Senate, voting in California, because she's well plugged because she was the mayor of um, San Francisco, which has a large Chinese American community, at one time the largest, and may still be, I just don't know if it is, because there's other ones that have grown big. Um, but 
you know, uh, all kinds of, you know, political intelligence. It's not necessarily secret, but to know who might be friendly to China and who might not be friendly to China and who China could, and we've definitely had cases of, um, oh, it was just the Clintons getting money from China, so it doesn't really count. But we, we know that um, there were cases that um, Chinese Americans got large sums of money from China and then passed, and then, no, and then they themselves gave money to um, people that worked for them, supposedly, and then those people supposedly gave money to candidates. Really, what that is, is um, the person may have had enough cash to give out, but it's you're limited to $2,500 in donations or whatever, and it's changed a little bit over, over the years, um, to a candidate per cycle. Oh, well, I want to give them $10,000. Well, you, 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 and you, and you. Um, I'm going to um, send in a check in your name or give a cash donation, and you're going to claim that it's yours. And they go, yes, sir, no problem. You know, so they're technically, well, they're breaking the law, but they're also technically sort of going, ah, oh, I'm theoretically giving you this money only on the idea that it's your money, but you're not reporting it as income or anything like that. But then you're you're going to give it to the candidate or to the, you know, the party that, or, you know, the, um, the campaign. You know, so the candidate may not know any of this, but probably does. Um Again, I've been in the car. <laughs> um, so, you know, so we know that various elements in China has funneled money, given money to people, and then similar amounts of money have been transferred through front people to, to um, campaigns through China. So that is entirely a felony. In, in the United States. And since it was all involved with the Clinton administration or the Clinton campaign, nobody was ever um, prosecuted for it. Yeah. Because, hey, it's the Clintons. They're corrupt. And no one wants to rock the boat and go after the Clintons because, you know, hey. Um, but, hey, if it's somebody else, we're going to hammer them hard, particularly other political parties. But, yeah, um... So, knowing that they've done that, you know, because it's been pr published in newspapers, you know, including things like the New York Times or the uh, or L.A. Times or whatever, um, knowing that that's happened, I am then absolutely sure that at some play stages, whether it's a city council, which is a pretty major position for San Francisco, it's not like some little small city like San Jose, and it's even, you know, the last mayor of San Jose, or if not the last mayor, one of the major, one of the, the recent mayors of San Jose is, oh, currently governor of California now. And then, of course, the mayor of San Francisco is currently senator of California. So, yeah, um, so that they would funnel money, say, in a Democratic primary towards the candidate who would be more um, friendly to China, you know, has more open you know, to know sort of background of who's who. So it may not may not be anything that would be classified or secret leaked out, but it's still political intelligence, and we know, and we're all boogie-booed about um, some Russian bot, farm bots influencing our election, but when we have evidence in the 90s, in the 2000s, we have evidence of China funneling money into American elections, no one cares because it's all going to the Democratic Party because it's California. Not that the China is only exclusively giving money to, to Democrats. It's just they have the hook in with, and I know we've, we're going on about this, but I hope it's interesting. Um, they have that hook into um, Diane Feinstein is that when she was mayor of San Francisco, she was the first city that got sort of twin cities. I don't know if you know the practice in America is often a... Um, a major, a, well, even a minor city will sort of like go, hey, yeah, partner up with uh, different cities in different countries or different parts of the world. So, um, you know, um, L.A. will twin city with Yokohama or something in Japan since it's a port city um, or whatever. So something like that and sort of do co cross-cultural programs and sort of promote up, um, you know, some students will visit from either side, and a lot of it's pretty harmless, and, you know, 
doing pretty good. Well, San Francisco under Diane Feinstein, I forget which city it was in, in communist China, was the first um, city of that to do that um, with communist China. And Diane Feinstein was, I think as that, and then later as a senator, was the major push inside the United States to go, well, if we just open up trade with communist China, it will help bring liberal democracy to China and help them get rid of their totalitarian state. Now, all the big business guys, including Republicans, are going, money, 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 money. Oh, but it's okay to trade with communists. But, ooh, um evil Saudi um, monarchists. We can't trade with them because they do bad things to their people. Yes, they are evil, bad, doing things to their people, but the communists, they're well-meaning evil people, so we can do business with theirs. So, yeah, that's the hypocrisy thing. Um, but it's, you know, so, yeah, even the Republicans and all the companies want to do business in the Chinese market, the Chinese market. And so the Democrats spin this because they believe that socialists are ultimately good people trying to do good things. Um, spin this into a um, situation in which, um, yeah, if we just open up the markets in China and bring them into the International Monetary Fund and other things like this, they will become nice people or nicer people. I've yet to see any evidence of that, and they're, to my best of my knowledge, you know, they're not living up to their agreements on Hong Kong and other things, that they don't appear to be any evidence of liberalization because of economic engagement from the West. Now, of course, the other option is, is if we had isolated them like we are doing and have previously been doing with North Korea, is that they might collapse. Or they, we might put a, I don't know, we can do a Wilson 13 points or just a five-point system. If you meet these five things and we all agree that, that you've met them, then we'll let you in or something. Instead of having the carrot, you know, or having the stick first, you know, you've got to do this, then we'll give you the carrots. We, we've been giving them carrots, hoping it changes their, their behavior, and it has been. But Diane Feinstein um, promoted that and was the major pusher for it in the United States. State. And through most of this time period, I don't know exactly all of it, but most of this time period, this Chinese-American driver drove for her. Hmm. Yeah, foreign influence in American elections is definitely a Russian thing. Only a Russian thing, and we don't have to worry about it from anywhere else. Yeah, sorry for that weird path but um okay so <sighs> parafascist i there were fascist party or parties in japan not this party um that was really small got like one or two seats in their parliament um in one election, you know, and then sort of disappear. And sometime, um, I think more 41 or early 42 or something like, they disband because basically to fold into this, in, in my understanding. Um, I just, because it's partially this, this simplistic propaganda that, that they sell, sold from World War II. Um, and... This is also a very strong element here is, as we've talked about, in 36, in 37, in 38. It is definitely a out-of-control military that's being aggressive in China. Not the Japanese government in um, Tokyo. The policies that the army is pursuing including some of its attacks in and around Shanghai and other places, killing um, Westerners is contrary to the policy of the Japanese foreign office. So several times, and I collected a bunch of stuff where they paid reparations, they paid large sums of money to Western powers over some dead people. Um, 
and basically the army's just doing its thing. The foreign ministry can't control it, so the foreign ministry is trying to keep international relations good. But with this now, and then for sure by the time you get to Tojo in 41, you're definitely seeing this formerly out of control military, political, industrial complex taking over the um, uh, Tokyo-based governments. And I say that because, I mean, like the foreign ministry, the um, education ministry. The, the minister of education during at least most of World War II was um, a guy named Tojo. He was technically, officially, um, the head of the ministry of education. What the hell did Tojo know about it in education? No, he just got to control that department. And basically it was the deputy secretary of whatever, of the, the ministry that ran it. But he, but Tojo got to pick and who was in charge of it because it was um, that um, agency that was also sort of monitoring all the newspapers and other publications, you know, sort of like, um, you know, the, the equivalent of Joseph Goebbels department kind of thing. And although Tojo had no good qualifications like Joseph Goebbels is a great guy to run propaganda if you want propaganda run well um, Tojo has no um, no aptitude for it but he gets control of it and has somebody else and I don't know the guy's name and I don't know if I ever dug out who who the main guy was I forget right now um, but I've dug into some of this pretty deep um, looking for ministers and whatnot for Japan so we definitely see this move to a totalitarian style single party type state it wasn't that way in 1930 it grows it's now here i will agree that they're establishing stronger stronger controls onto it still at this point um because obviously historically at this point there's still the war raging in, in china um, the emperor could control things, but eventually it gets out of his control even more. Because the emperor could have controlled things in, um, in China and would have had it been unsuccessful. Um, I'm not just stating that from my opinion, but from looking at, um, or from my readings, and several times that, including stuff over Singapore and some of the other things, um, several things don't go so well. They, they work out, but they don't go so well. And um, the emperor calls in several of the, you know, people sort of somewhat responsible for it and has a talk with them. Um, one of the things that really is coming to mind is the failure over Guadalcanal. He, the emperor gets reassured, so he sort of like lets the, the, the war continue. But God, the war's already going with the Western powers. But even then, I think there was almost a moment that had they not convinced Hirohito that they had everything under control, basically lied to, lied to him all to hell, in my opinion. But maybe it's maybe they were telling the truth as they see it, you know, again, uh, you know, from a certain point of view, Star Wars reference. But um, they may have thought they had it under control and um, didn't. But they didn't have it under control but they whether they thought they did or they just said they did i don't know um so he lets sort of the war continue at that point instead of trying to really put out you know um peace feelers with major concessions you know not in his mind i'm sure not us or the allies occupying you know the homelands of japan but major withdrawals from places like the philippines and Indonesia and maybe even China, um, you know, just to get a peace, but he gets reassured. And I'm sure earlier on, when it's just the China situation, had things been a complete and total disaster, I think the, the because none of the heads of you know, the Kwangtung army, um, if they got a blatant, explicit, and then if public, you know, um, if, um, the emperor, you know, says, puts it through channels, you come to Tokyo, and if they ignore it, he then comes on the radio and says, I order General Yamashita or Tojo or whoever it might be at the time, and whoever to Tokyo now, they're coming. I mean, there, there's no way 
no way they could ignore if it's a public demand. And he could sack them and put somebody else in charge of it <coughs> with strong orders. And if you don't um, do as um, ordered, you're fired and or worse. Um, he could have done it, but it gets spun out of control, obviously to the point that when he's trying to surrender, they're trying to do a coup against him. And they weren't going to plan on killing the, the emperor. They were just going to lock him up in his palace. not let him surrender or communicate with anybody else the coup that tries against him. So, and it is a totalitarian state. It is a hyper-nationalistic state. It um, is a militaristic state. It is a um, uh, an aggressive state, not just, oh, we're in a war, so we're fighting it. But, um, you know, they've been aggressive in China long before, but that faction has taken over. So it is all that, and if that is para-fascist, okay, but it's really not Mussolini's fascism. And Mussolini's fascism has, as I've come to understand it, two elements. One, the fascist element, that is sort of, um, to one degree or another, universal. And two, the... Um, neo-roman empire element you know wanting to recreate the empire those two things are interconnected in mussolini's mind because he's seeing italy as the rebirth of rome and rome should be what rome was you know is he really thinking he's going to reown paris someday who knows what's in his mind or is he just trying to think that he's going to get the mediterranean coast of france or, i don't know what he's you know, it's always daydreams, but what is he really planning? I don't know. But you could just look at fascism in the terms of, uh, you know, Italy or Romania or, excuse me, a little bit of hiccups right now. Um, Sweden or whatever else that doesn't need to be externally aggressive. You know, it doesn't need to be trying to recreate some lost greater empire. Um, so those, but so those are two different things. Um, the ideology of fascism and trying to build a greater empire. Now, of course, Japan never had a greater empire than what it had at this time. And um, so that is sort of the aggressive militarism, but it doesn't really come into fascism. And almost none of the sort of at least that I can tell. Again, I don't read Japanese. I mean, I can recognize a few characters and whatnot. And I used to be able to read Hiragana, I think. God, it's been so long. And I, you know, I could phonetically sound it out. You know, the idea of Taisei, Yoku, San, Kai. You know, if that was written in Hiragana at one time, I could, you know, pronounce it out. Wouldn't necessarily know what it meant, you know, to translate it, but I would... Um, be able to read it at that point again that that was like 30 years ago so so don't you know hold me too much to that so we'll get this event okay so um 1940 elections okay um imperial was parafash created by parafash yes okay it's the same thing so we'll become head of government so we're losing him. Um, uh, control click. So this is this, what they're calling fascist as opposed to national socialist. <sighs> control click. I guess I just sort of rebel at this because There was a fascist party, and it's not this, and I forget its name, that was ideologically fascist. Okay, well. Okay, so we have, you know, we can't replace him, all these guys. Okay, well, um, foreign minister. Um, oh, what 
Council. He is um, ideological crusader. Okay, here we are. Um, well, we have. Hmm. Ruling party support. This gets us more susceptible to. Um, daily descent. Change that's better national unity. He seems to be a better person here. I don't know. Um. I don't know. Okay. Armaments Minister. Who again is it? It's okay. Military Entrepreneur. Shota Kazui. Uh... Okay, I see air build, land build. I don't like that negative efficiency. See where we can get air build minus 5% with no negative efficiency. I like this better. Um, minister. Okay, um, ruling party support, partisan efficiency. Okay, Prince of Terror. Um, or he would be better. Silent Lawyer. Leadership. I like that leadership bonus. Special units, right? In fact. Okay, well, we could go with somebody like him, but it's a different party. But we could go with him. Same party, same stats. So we'll select him. Head of Intelligence, this guy, Dismal Enigma. Which is the same thing for. Standard, um. What's his name over in Germany? Uh, I like Industrial Specialist. Do we have a uh, uh, fascist so called Industrial Specialist? Technical specialist leadership, I see faction. Now I like that because the ICs so we can do with a hit on the money. Um so we'll do this. Okay, um Chief of Staff here. Um School of Defense, School of Defense, School of Fire Support. Okay, I guess so. And same guy, different set of stats. So, okay, same set of stats for those two guys. Carrier production efficiency, naval strike efficiency, aircraft. That's who we have, right? Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's okay. Chief of the Air Force. Yamamoto Isoroka. Or it's Isoroka Yamamoto in the Western style. Um, don't know if he would be part of the control click, as you're, they're calling it here. Um, but I wouldn't put him part of this so much, but I may be wrong about that. I would... Because I don't know that he specifically was a you know member of any particular party. He was definitely like a social conservative kind of thing, but I don't know. And these things don't necessarily all fit. Um, port strike, port strike, um, naval strike efficiency. Yeah, that's probably good. Okay, so um, 
those are the people that we've now changed and let's oh cancel close i want to let the clock roll a bit because as i've said if i pause for a long time and talk or not talk but just pause for a long time and micromanage and you know, reorganize things and then try to save it without letting the clock roll i've often noticed a crash which we didn't get here um which is good so just just to let you know that that you know because i was reorganizing up here before this episode um so all of these cores are right here and all of the their previous i think i already put there but um all of their previous units that were way too far away i sent somewhere else and i um the ones that had HQ or you know core HQ is too far away I reorganized in here I did all of that and then I saved the game and then I restarted it just uh, before starting this episode to make sure that and a bunch of other fiddling like sending a bunch of these guys that need to now be sent somewhere else out so I just just to let you know that that may cause a crash if you're doing a lot of micromanaging and then not letting the clock roll and then trying to save it don't know what it is but I've noticed it so thank you for watching I do appreciate that if you would um, and you haven't already please like this video I really appreciate that if you have again if you haven't already please subscribe to the channel and of course I love hearing um, from you about any of the topics or anything else interesting see you next time for more hearts of iron